Walking the World Collected Dhamma Reflections by Ajahn Sunandra Another Dimension In the early days of my practice, I always felt very moved by expressions of kindness. But I had the strange preconception that it was strong to start practicing kindness by being kind to myself. I believed that would be selfish. How could I start with myself? I should start with others. That was the right way to go. I suppose it is part of our culture to weave real love as something unselfish and believe that loving means thinking about others before we think about ourselves. But the more we know our mind, the more we realize that there is only a little gap between what goes on in our minds and how we act in our lives. When the mind is still untrained, there is only a tiny gap between its contents and the way it manifests externally. When we are angry, we just manifest anger. When we are upset, we manifest this immediately. We are just acting out our mind state. But after practicing for a while, we begin to appreciate that although we may not yet be able to act like a saint, at least we have a teaching that enables us to restrain the mind. In other words, we have a choice. We have an option. What makes us miserable in life is being without any options, feeling we are slaves to ourselves, feeling that we don't have any choice. That is so miserable, so terrible. It feels like being in prison with no way out. Many people who are angry and upset can act out their miserable mind state without any qualms. They don't know any better. We too, like other human beings who surround us, have never been given much of an idea of how to go about life skillfully. We learn from very early childhood how to respond to worldly situations. We learn how to be clever. We learn how to use our intelligence. We learn lots of knowledge about this or that. We learn how to defend ourselves, how to fight people who bother us. But we are not taught much about metta, about kindness. When I first became interested in the Buddhist teachings, metta, loving kindness, just being kind, seemed to me to be such a weak state of mind. I thought it was okay to be kind, but it is no big deal. I wondered why I should train the mind to be kind. I would not have minded doing a course in increasing my cleverness or intelligence, but increasing metta was not a priority. But as we meditate, we can see how metta takes on a dimension which we don't often achieve otherwise, a sense of acceptance, a sense of giving our mind space to be as it is. We can stop reacting to the way things are or reacting to the reactions we have because of ideals or ideas of how we should be. 
then we know metta as a new dimension of not engaging, not reacting, not pushing away things we don't like, not creating aversion to anything unpleasant or unlikable. This is the training of the mind. The training doesn't ask us to be any particular way in any particular situation. But through it, we begin to teach our mind how to recognize the mind state of kindness. As we are sitting, we recognize when we are going to war with ourselves or trying to control our thoughts and perceptions so that they constantly fit into the perfect world we want. We start to realize how our mind tries to fit our consciousness into a little box. We have this tendency to what to control because we remember something that was pleasant, something that worked for us in the past or worked for us even now. And we have the idea that if we do things the same way we did them in the past, we will be okay. So we look through the microscope of our mind and notice the pressure to keep going back to what we know, to keep fitting our world into the box of the comfortable and the known. The well-trodden path that our mind has already walked. But in the process of going back to the past, we are pressurizing our minds. We are not open and relaxed in the present moment. Have you noticed that when we sit, there is a tendency to try to make our bodily form and bodily experience fit with the memory of somebody else's experience. Maybe 10 years ago, we read books or heard a teacher talking, for example, about the bliss of jhana. And that memory can make us feel inadequate for many years because we have never experienced the bliss of jhana. Memory sets up a sense of pressure in our everyday life as a meditator because we are caught up in it, lost in thinking about what the teacher said years ago instead of being present in here and now. I suppose this need to be present here and now is something I learned from my teacher, Ajahn Sumedho. He spoke with great confidence about returning again and again to what he called the real, no matter what we are thinking about. Always back to the real. It takes a while to know that the real means facing life completely openly as it is. Life is always open and the mind too is always open. But we have created so many little boxes and little worlds. These boxes are all created through memories, perceptual memories, feeling memories, thought memories, stories, and even sensory memories. A certain sound we like, a certain taste. Our world is very much boxed up into this memory cage. So the mind is good at creating pressure and stress and holding on to a whole world of memories. But if we just go back to the simple act of practicing metta, then when we start to face the present moment, we begin to return our back on the past and 
learn the practice of letting go. We learn to let go of the world of memories, letting go of those boxes, drawers and cupboards where we have neatly packed our consciousness. When we practice mindfulness, we are aware of a mind that is not caught in memory. We can relate to consciousness without the baggage of our box of memories and then we can see the memories clearly as they are. We still see the past, but we see everything from a fresh perspective. We suddenly have a fresh new mind looking at all these things. Then we learn how to discard the things we don't need and keep the things we do need. We can sort out in an intelligent way what is helpful and what isn't. Remembering our mother's phone number is useful, but we might not need to keep the address of all our old partners after 20 years. That is just one example. We carry many things around in ourselves that are completely redundant. We can see many stories we carry in our minds. Stories about a reality that no longer exists. Most of our stories are produced from memories. Memories are the mind of the past. In our practice, we look at this mechanical conditioning. Once we begin to let go of this habit and open up to the world, the result is quite magical. The world is a magical place when we stop creating it from memory. But memories don't go away so easily. They can be experienced as quite solid and they have a haunting effect on some people. They keep coming back. We need to bear with the karmic forces of our memories until they eventually fall back by themselves. And this brings us back to Mitta, patience, kindness. The first aspect of metta is non-contention. Not contending with the world as it is. This involves intense training. The whole discipline takes effect in that moment of restraint, of mindfulness, sati sampajanya, mindfulness, and clear understanding of what is happening here and now, which doesn't need memory. What is happening in here and now is new. It takes a lot of courage to move away from the tendency to build our reality out of memory and open up the heart and mind to a much vaster reality, a universe that is not limited by the past. This is really the blessing of our meditation practice. Developing the heart in this way takes us to a place where we enjoy life because we begin to sense that it doesn't have a limit. Of course, we have physical limits, but we don't feel so trapped anymore. Our heart is not really limited, but unless we look at it closely and start using the tools of mindfulness to dismantle its little partitions, it is difficult to gain insight into the freedom and potential that we all have. But once we have had this experience, it gives us the confidence that this is the way to go, that the practice works. 
non contending with life as it is means giving space to oneself and others not asking others to be what we want them to be when we are in our little box we may feel very comfortable we may have a whole list of theories and when we encounter others we may be quite convinced that they are wrong and we are right that their boxes are just not as good as ours and that our little boxes are much fancier and more interesting than their little boxes so the quality of metta is a very important aspect of our practice in the sutta on loving kindness we read let none deceive another or despise any being in any state that's pretty clear isn't it the text continues let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another yet it's quite shocking to witness the cruelty coursing through our mind when things don't go our way somebody upsets us and a cruel thought arises in the mind we might not act on it but it is still quite a shock to witness this tendency the cruelty we have in ourselves is part of nature as dhamma practitioners whether we are in lay life or not we tend to visualize ourselves as kind loving people and yet cruelty is there in unguarded moments when we are pushed a bit beyond our limits we can see the desire to harm someone who is harming us in his teaching on love and kindness the buddha says even as a mother protects her child her only child so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings he continues radiating kindness over the entire world spreading upwards to the sky and downwards to the depths outwards and unbounded freed from hatred and ill will this is what the spirit of metta is about we might not be able to be a loving being constantly but we can learn how to receive our hatred and ill will kindly without judgment and let them go even in a moment of being mindful of hatred and ill will in ourselves and not acting on them we are already freed from their power in that moment of clear seeing they have lost their power to blind us and that experience of letting go is quite liberating when i was an anagarika i helped with cooking meals for ajan kittisaro he was then a monk and very ill one morning i told ajan sumedho i have to quit cooking for ajan kittisaro he asked why i said i have so much anger so much frustration i feel i'm poisoning him poisoning his food with my anger Ajahn Sumedho replied, Well, you are aware of your anger, aren't you? I answered, I am jolly well aware of my anger. Well, it's not going anywhere then. At that moment, I knew what he meant. 
that anger was seen and it wasn't going anywhere. It was in my mind, but it was not leaping out, bouncing off the wall and jumping into a frying pan. So this is something that we need to remember. Sometimes we don't have much sense of having a lot of metta in our heart. But the very fact that we are aware of that is already an act of non-contention of metta. Not creating more negative stuff around it and beating ourselves up because we feel bad. Beating ourselves up is not very kind. And besides, this sort of response is completely useless. There comes a point in the training when we realize that the only response to life is kindness, appreciation, encouragement, and a sense of uplifting ourselves, inspiring our heart then metta becomes a very natural part of us. We can see ourselves as something natural in this universe, a kind of plant that needs kindness and attention, but not in a blind way. Let's remember that this kindness and attention are intended to lead to liberation from greed hatred and delusion. That does not mean agreeing with everything. The goal of our path remains clear. Sometimes, metta can manifest as a mother slapping her child on the face because she is just about to run across the street and be hit by a bus. Sometimes, we have to do that to ourselves too. Stop it. Don't do that. And be quite firm when we know we are just about to do something that will result in much regret, much anxiety and guilt. And then trigger our tendency to deal with this suffering by suppressing the guilt, getting distracted or doing something more stupid. These things don't mean that you have to change your life or become somebody else. It is more the humble recognition of what is now. Is there something in the way now? Nothing is in the way when you are really prepared to learn from everything. So you can recognize that much. There is nobody in the way. Nothing in the way. I remember that Ajahn Sumedho some years ago insisted those long silent retreats in the winter should be done in a spirit of convenience. When I heard this, I said, how on earth you can be silent and convivial at the same time? I thought that was very strange. What could he mean by conviviality? But because I have profound trust in Ajahn Sumedho's wisdom, my heart immediately started contemplating. What does he mean by this? At the end of the three months retreat, we had a community sharing. Everybody talked about their insights. I shared with my friends that, at first, I thought the theme of conviviality on a silent formal retreat seemed like madness. But when I worked through the theme in my own practice day by day, something profound happened. An insight arose that I am not in my way. That was the inside, I was not in my way. Before that, 
I was always practicing with me having to do its things. But suddenly, with conviviality percolating through, me was not in the way of anything. At the time, it was a revelation that I had seen myself as being in the way. But suddenly, I was not standing in my own way. I was completely okay here and now. There was perfection in just being with this person here. Of course, when I was not in my way, nobody else was in my way either. There was a soft energy rapport with people. People are fine. They were okay. They were my friends. It was truly convivial without having to speak to anybody. There was an energy of friendliness. I had not seen that very well before. Before, it was often more like, shut up, I'm practicing metta. I'm exaggerating. I never actually said that. But it was that type of mind state. We don't even know when we are doing this. We don't say it, but it is there in the air. People can feel it. Without being fully conscious, we use our mindfulness to push people away. When we are not convivial, even without saying anything, without doing anything, there is a kind of tension. You can feel the vibes get out of my aura. This tendency to contend with the world is not metta. When we have a convivial attitude, we don't have to smile or say anything, but our body is quite relaxed and happy, and everybody notices it and can even feel the energy of non-contention and metta. Chapter 2 Have you ever noticed? Have you noticed how, when we look at ourselves, we keep bumping into our obstacles? That is why the practice can feel quite frustrating sometimes. If we don't have somebody experienced who can explain to us that obstacles are actually quite okay, that to feel wretched, undetermined and miserable is fine because these are only states of mind, perceptions that are impermanent. Naturally, the backdrop of all those things is not always clear. That is why mindfulness is cultivated. Mindfulness is the backdrop. Sometimes things are very deeply rooted in our mind and it's not easy to uproot them and let go of them. Sometimes it takes years of witnessing particular patterns or particular responses to life before we are free of them. Everything in us knows better than to hold on to them. Yet we have other emotional aspects that are preventing the process of letting go. We have enough psychotherapeutic knowledge and understanding to realize that those emotional patterns can go all the way back to childhood or even past life experiences. But even though our mind may be feeling stuck, a great chunk of ourselves is not stuck at all and feels fine. So to be able to keep turning around 
and taking refuge in the part in us that is not stuck is a kind of art and skill. That's what is good about the spiritual path. We are able to keep looking at the part of ourselves that is already free and we take refuge in that. Of course, we need all the help we can get. It is very fortunate to have a good teacher such as Ajahn Sumedho to whom you can go for advice and who is not necessarily going to pamper you or tell you how good you are, but will remind you to stay mindful, wakeful, and very present with things that may be quite difficult or even unbearable. In the practice, you don't cling to anything that arises in the mind. You make the very clear intention to let go. You find that if you do this often enough with whatever arises, with difficulties and problems, it really works. Something shifts and it is transformed. Your world changes. And as your mind gain more and more confidence in the realm of the Dhamma, truth, liberation, it loses its trust in your desires and fears. A lot of our inability to let go comes from fear. We are frightened to letting go of things because everything we know, even our misery, is comforting on an emotional level. It seems to feel better than not knowing. But Ajahn Sumedho taught us for many years to train the mind to face the unknown. When questions arise, just say, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Training the mind just like that. Do that in your everyday life. Allow the Dhamma to inform your consciousness rather than continuing on the treadmill of the conditioned mind's activities. All the conditioned mind can do is go from one thought to another to another. It's not that there is something wrong with the thinking mind. The thinking mind is useful for contemplation, for reflection, for clarification and for living your everyday life. As you contemplate the space of your mind, you can look at thoughts not as a rigid belief system, but just as energy, as images or forms. Then clarify what it is you want to consciously think and what you don't want to think. We can often be quite confused by our mind because we find many mixed waves in it. On this path, you sometimes reach a place where the only thing left is to develop a sense of humor. Fortunately, that comes quite naturally within the training. Because what you have to go through is sometimes so ridiculous that it makes you laugh a lot. You may spend several hours in the forest at Chitrast Monastery, spreading metta to all beings, radiating compassion to all sentient beings throughout the whole world. Then as you return to the nun's cottage, you cross paths with the one difficult nun to whom you just sent tons of metta and in a split second you are filled with rage. 
how can you not laugh? Or you may get very, very upset about something as mundane as the way people prepare salad dressing. Your mind can feel ennobled by lots of noble thoughts and have profound insight into the nature of reality leading to the realization that everything is changing, that it's all appearance and it's all in your mind. Then you happen to be cooking in the kitchen and suddenly go completely berserk because someone chops carrots, not the French way. The French would never do that. Never. Who cares? We only eat one meal a day. So who cares how we chop the carrots? We have all these ennobling insights and then you are in the kitchen and that's where you get into the real work. What do we do with our emotional nature in the kitchen? That's where our buttons get pushed and things get really heated. Monastery life is like a huge cauldron or a pressure cooker. Sometimes you feel as if everyone is boiling together. People who come to the monastery may have no idea of this reality because at first everything looks quite peaceful. For a newcomer, everybody can appear angelic, pure-hearted, loving, neatly dressed, peaceful and harmonious. Most people become quite inspired at first. Then they get into the monastic routine and the daily life, working together. Soon, some of them come to me and say, Sister, I have never experienced this in my life before. I see somebody putting a lid on in a certain way and I feel like hitting them. Or... I have been reading a book on metta, trying to develop metta for the last several weeks. But when I see this person walking in front of me, I feel like enraged by her. Although I have never spoken to her. Can you see what we are up against? Once you start witnessing the life of your mind, it's quite funny. But it's not so funny when we witness the wounds that go really deep. We can get very hurt. We are very susceptible creatures. And our little egos get agitated when they are not pampered or sweetened by nice words. You can say in front of a group, I'm an angry type. I'm very impatient. I'm not very nice with people. I can be so nasty. I have got a lot of weaves and opinions about things. I'm selfish and can be quite jealous as well. But if someone agrees with you, what? As long as you tell yourself how stupid you are, it's no problem. As long as the ego is talking about itself, it finds all kind of ways of deluding itself. But if somebody else tells you that you are jealous and ignorant, look at your reaction. Me? Don't attack me. What about you? That's how we usually react. We go on the offensive. The mind has a lot of ways of deluding itself. That's what we learn through the practice. The path of practice is divided into three aspects. Sealer or ethics, samadhi 
or the practice of meditation that includes effort or energy, concentration and mindfulness, and panya or wisdom, which is the first two links on the path right understanding and right intention. Mental development, the aspect that includes mindfulness, effort and concentration is not so difficult to relate to as long as we deal with techniques such as breathing or mindfulness of the body. But it's often much more difficult to relate to the actual hindrances or the obstacles to practice such as confusion and frustration. The practice leads to a lot of joy, happiness and peace. But as long as it is dependent on something, it is going to change. So we can't count on something that depends on impermanent causes. This practice is leading you to understanding the mind, which is in many ways very treacherous and tricky. It's a real skill to relate to ourselves and to our mind in a sound, sane, kind and patient way. In the face of this trickiness and delusion, it is a training, it is an education, it is something we do little by little. We gradually learn how to do it. It doesn't come by itself. We learn to re really take care of our actions by body and speech and mind. Most of us start with the mind. We become interested in meditation and then notice how angry we can get. Or we notice the kilesas, the afflictive emotions or unskillful mental states that are very unpleasant. Then we notice our attachment, even attachment to being a good person is painful because it is going to blind you and project all kinds of things onto the world. That's what we get ourselves into sometimes when we become fanatical about being a Buddhist. We want to convert everybody. We go home and start telling our friends about how we have become a better person. We have gone on some retreat and gained some insight and now we are more at peace. We attach to this, become opinionated about our peacefulness and start projecting it into other people. If other people are not peaceful, they are just bad Buddhist or simply a nuisance and they are obviously not practicing. I am practicing but they are not. There are a lot of elements in ourselves that are blinding. We unravel these things as we become ready to open to our lives fully, fearlessly. You can only do this if your goal is very clear. Reflect often on why you started on this path in the first place and what you want to do with it or whether you really want to be free. You may be surprised to discover that perhaps you don't want to be free that you just want to have your piece of cake and eat it too. But hearing the voice is enough. You don't have to believe it because it's not you. If you can listen to these voices, the awareness of them is the path. 
It is here and now, and it is the refuge of awareness. It's where the mind is eventually released from all obstacles, all pain and all miseries. At some point, you have to be very clear that this path of practice is for the sole purpose of freeing the heart from miseries, dukkha. So when you experience dukkha, don't shy away from it. This is the opportunity. It's not a problem. It's your opportunity to liberate your mind from its attachment to ignorance. It's what you are supposed to see. But as soon as you witness something painful, there is a reaction that points at someone or something and says, it's your fault. You throw the ball into somebody else's court instead of looking at the source and taking responsibility for your reaction. To read the mind in the correct way is very powerful training. Right intention is not harming and non-ill will. The commitment to be totally harmless towards others and ourselves. This means fully accepting who we are and how we are. The third aspect of right intention is renunciation, letting go. On the wisdom aspect of the path, two parts are about being kind to oneself and to other people. And the third one is about releasing, letting go. This winter, my teacher was talking about blessings. How do you bless somebody? Blessing is kindness, isn't it? When you bless somebody, you are not going to curse them, are you? When I feel blessed, I feel very happy. My teacher gave me a wonderful teaching on blessings. The teaching is this, do not create anybody in your mind. Isn't that wonderful? Of course you can recite, may you be happy, may you be great, may you be wonderful, may you have a long life, and so on. Wishing somebody to be happy is fine, but maybe you can't do that. How are you going to bless them if you hate their guts? Maybe that's asking too much. And you can recognize that. My teachers say that if you want to bless life in general, to bring a sense of happiness to your own life, just don't create people in your mind. That's blessing them because you free them from your own problems. You don't imprison them with your own anger, your own expectations, your own frustration, your own miserable mind. You don't ask them to be any way other than the way they are. Isn't that wonderful? And it works. It works. Letting go. Questions and answers. Question. When I interacted with people, I find a different person interacting with different people. It's disconcerting. Answer. It can be. But as we observe ourselves, we discover many characters in ourselves. Don't worry about it. In one day, you can have 20 different characters coming up. Question. So, which one is real? Answer. None. None are real. On a conventional level, we have to be somebody. We learn to dance, 
with these different characters. 26 years ago, I would have thought, what hypocrisy. I'm like this with this person and I'm like that with that person. How hypocritical that is. No, it's not. We just learn about humanity. With some people, we speak in one way. With other people, we speak differently. We just become wise about human nature. You talk to your mother differently from the way you talk to your lover, don't you? The way you talk to your child is going to be different from how you talk to your best friend. If somebody pampers us and says how wonderful we are, we might give them our sweet character. If I push your buttons, I get your angry character. We have all these different characters. We just have to know they exist, but they are not really us. We have got endless selves in ourselves. Question. When there is an interaction between two people, it's not the selves. It is the interaction. It's as if the interaction is what is in the now, not the people. It's the interaction that is creating the present, not the people. Answer. It's many conditions that are creating the present. Even the way we have eaten our lunch couldn't create the conditions that start taking place in an interaction or what we are going to do in the evening can put us in a different mood. There are many things, many factors, many elements that can influence us in an, any interaction with anybody or any situation. Question. I would just like to say I appreciate your honesty about your mind and the way it is. It is so much easier to be with myself after hearing that. Answer. I'm very glad. Question. In practice, I have noticed all the characters and faces that come up. My mind wants to take the teachings of the Buddha and interpret them to mean that I should be whipping out these characters. I know this is not the practice, but that is where my mind wants to take it that my practice is supposed to be about whipping those things out, that I should be faceless being. Something deeper in me knows this is an extreme. I'm wondering if you can tell me how to sit with that. Answer. There is a very strong tendency in us to want to get rid of things. It has a name. We can actually recognize it. It's one of the causes of suffering. It's a second noble truth of suffering. Dukkha, wanting to get rid of the things you don't like, for example, the created perception in your mind of the various selves you don't like. This force is strong in all of us. We all suffer from it. We all have this disease of wanting the things we like and wanting to get rid of the things we don't like. This is called Bhavatanha. Attachment to becoming and Vibhavatanha, attachment to non-becoming. We don't want to become those nasty characters. We want to become the pleasantness of an empty, peaceful mind. So we need to notice when this is happening. 
It's not simply a matter of recognizing the characters and the perception, idea and thought. You need to get in touch with the feeling underlying them. It's an aspect of aversion. It's an averse mind state. It is the basis for this form of thinking. So that is how we can start undoing this tendency. Just notice it. Just name it aversion. There is nothing wrong with it. Its opposite is wanting to become successful and wonderful and peaceful. And it's called Bhavatanha. The desire to become something that we like. It is painful to notice this tendency. It's hard to accept this part of ourselves that we need to understand better rather than trying to wipe it out. But it's very normal. It's normal tendency. To know this aspect of Dukkha Samudaya better, this desire to get rid of things we don't like is our field of investigation. It's very powerful, especially in the Western mind. We tend to be perfectionist, quite angry, errors type. We know how to get rid of things. In fact, our conditioning is such that when we don't know how to get rid of things we don't like, we are seen as stupid. It's stupid to be patient with the things we don't like. And yet, that is what the Buddhist teaching is asking of you. To be very patient with the things you don't like. You can see what we are up against, that we are faced with. Question you compared cultures and talked about the Western culture encouraging critical thinking. I have always thought that this tendency in our culture is something we should try to overcome. You present it very differently. When you compare it to Asian cultures, you said they tend to be more faithful. I have always thought that if we were more like that, we would be more successful on the Buddhist path. That's not how you presenting it. Answer. Let's not forget that the Buddhist path is not about becoming anything. It's about understanding what is preventing you from being free from suffering. It's not about taking a position for or against anything. As you said, it's broad generalization about Asians being more faith types and Westerners being more critical, discriminative types. But you realize at some point that you are not going to liberate somebody that you are not. You are not liberating an ideal, are you? We are liberating somebody who has been brought up in a culture founded in critical thinking. You will be happy to hear that within the Buddhist definition of different characters, the Buddha defined people with certain tendencies. You have the greedy type, the avarice angry type, the doubtful type, the discursive type, the faith type, and so on. The angry or avarice mind is very close to the wisdom mind. The critical, avarice, angry type of mind wants to get rid of things. The wisdom mind gives you the understanding to let go of things. With wisdom, you don't get rid of things. You let them go. The wisdom type 
knows immediately what the obstacle is. You develop a lot of energy to really practice with that. You understand quickly and that gives you a lot of confidence to get going with your practice because you know how it's going to work. So the averse tendency can be used for your own benefit once you bring wisdom into it. This averse tendency will lead you to feel more energy with which to let go of things. Because you see clearly how painful those things can be. We become averse to the things we don't like that are painful. We, re we rarely become averse to an ice cream or an ice cake. Mostly, we are averse to somebody saying something like, From tomorrow, we are going to fast for three days. Oh, horror. As Westerners, our mind's confidence grows in a different way. This doesn't mean we have less faith or confidence. It goes through a different channel. We often need to understand to begin to feel confident. We can know exactly where our path is going and know what to do. But we have little confidence or patience to set up the means to reach our goal. That's because we are not quite sure how to go about setting up the right conditions. We don't have confidence in doing the nitty-gritty to get results. For example, by being each day a little bit more mindful, a little bit kinder, a little bit more patient, less tyrannical, by gradually developing more skillful speech, little by little, and seeing the results over a period of time. The critical faculty is very important in Buddhist teaching. Though it includes an element of devotion, it's more a wisdom path. It's more a wisdom path that requires the capacity to think clearly, to understand clearly. That aspect of the mind is very important. Thinking can be an obstacle, but it is also a tool. Thinking allows you to come to a deeper understanding which can be integrated into your everyday life. This is where we are lacking. Often we don't know how to root our understanding into our everyday experience so that it can reverberate there and become real food for the heart.